So our, our guest today, I think most of you know, uh, she's a, Nancy's an economist, uh, she's the director of the School of Public Policy at uh, uh, Simon Fraser University. Uh, she's written books on uh, natural resource economics and uh, environmental economics. She's a very passionate teacher and I have it uh, firsthand from a number of your students that she's well loved and she's very, very dedicated to her students which is always good to see in this day of many other stressful things for faculty members to be doing and students can sometimes be not on the top priority list. But I think in Nancy's case, very definitely, uh, students are her number one priority. I think that's fair to say. But she does many other things uh, in her research on this topic, uh, travels the world, but she also, uh, in, in addition to talking the talk of her her discipline, she walks the walk. In fact, I'd say you actually run because she's been chair or uh, a member of the board of directors for BC Hydro, high profile public entity in British Columbia, very important entity in British Columbia. Uh, currently, she's not busy enough, she's chair of TransLink. Metro Vancouver. You can laugh. <laughs> now, yes right yesterday, she was very, she was very busy and one of the things that TransLink is doing is catching up on us for not having paid our tickets on SkyTrain. So if you haven't, they have new tools to collect. So I see a couple of you shifting uneasily in your seats. So no questions asked. After the talk, just drop off the cash with Nancy and everything will be okay. All right? So uh, on, on to Nancy's uh, talk. We, we do have the talking stick, which I guess you do hear me, and this is new, which is helpful that uh, we both have a, a live audience, yourselves, and a web-based audience. And this is primarily for them out there, but we can actually use it too, and we'll use this as the talking stick uh, for questions later. So without any further ado, please welcome, uh, I give a warm Saanich Oak Bay uh, welcome to Nancy, <laughs> Dr. Nancy O'Wallach. Thank you very much, uh, Lawrence, for that very kind introduction, and thanks to all of you. I know this is, uh, there are no classes in session, which means your opportunity costs of attending are low, <laughs> except that you might be doing something more fun. But unfortunately, the weather got a little cloudy, so that's lowered the costs again. So, so, so thanks for coming. Um, I, I, I'm sure this room is, uh, we've got a bunch of diverse people. so. I'm going to go a little quickly over some of the introductory slides and then get to the heart of my rant on uh, what I think government should be doing that they're not doing. And, uh, but if at any time at the end, if you want me to go back and cover some of the things I've done a little more quickly, I'd be delighted to do so. So what I'm going to define full cost pricing in a, in a minute, but why, why am I talking about this? Well, I'm talking about it because I think Canada's natural environment, our natural resources, our natural capital is at risk, significant risk. We're depleting it in all sorts of ways, and we're not taking the steps that are needed to provide for its long-term sustainability. And I'm going to talk a bit about why, but more importantly, I want to talk about what we can do to reverse this trend. And the, cause, the concept, the policy direction I'm talking about is pricing. This does not mean I'm advocating eliminating all other forms of regulation. But we have used in this country way too little pricing of our natural attributes as an adjunct to some of the other regulatory policies that we've got. And the data that I'm going to show you, some of the data, will show why I think it's important to add pricing to our list of policy tools and perhaps reduce the dependence on some of the other instruments, particularly at the federal level, but also at the provincial level that we've been using for a long time. So I'm going to focus on two things. One is uh, my rant part of it. And the rant is I think we should eliminate or phase out many of the subsidies that have been given predominantly to the energy and the extractive industry. And this includes not just subsidies to producers, but also to consumers. And I'm going to explain why I think those are not the best use of your tax dollars. The second thing 
is to say that you know we're just not pricing the things that are the bads in our environment, the environmental contaminants. And by not pricing them, we're making it free or very cheap to dispose of waste products. But just as importantly, we're not providing the incentives for both us as consumers and producers to invest in the activities that reduce their environmental impacts. And because this is a pick sponsored talk, I'll use carbon a lot as an example of where we could be doing better. So the third kind of theme I want to just keep reiterating is I'm quite dismayed at the rhetoric that is pervading certainly the federal discourse on jobs versus the environment. We've been here for a long time talking about folks, it's jobs and the environment. You can't have one without the other, in particular, no environment, no jobs. I mean, you know, let's be sort of realistic about it. But we've upped, at least certain elements have upped the rhetoric to say that, well, you can't favor environmental policies because that's destroying jobs. And that's an argument that I think is specious and moreover dangerous. So I'll, I'll come back to that rant if you want. Uh, natural capital, now, what's natural capital? It's our natural resources, the stuff that has good you know, quality market prices, our oil, our gas, our forests, our fish, but also the environmental resources, atmosphere, water, biodiversity, ecosystems, the stuff that becomes increasingly more challenging to measure, but no less important to our society, to our economy, to the whole planet. And the concept of natural capital is the word capital. It's a physical stock. It's something that we can measure physically. And we have other forms of capital that go into the economy. We have human capital, us, the room. You know, We invest in us that makes us do things and be smart and produce things. We also have produced capital, all the stuff around us. So natural capital is one of the other, and we have social capital, which is our sense of community. Natural capital is one of the four building blocks of a modern society that sustains not only communities, but you know, life on the planet. So ignoring this or not appropriately incorporating it into decision making is missing one of the key elements of what makes the economy work. That's capital. From capital, we've got flows. Capital is a stock. From capital, we've got flows, which are ecosystem services. And these are all the goods and services that is provided by nature. That includes things such as real products, real resources, water, trees, fish, land producing crops, but also the more esoteric things such as walks in the park, wilderness, protecting species, cultural values, etc. So we want to protect the natural capital stock to a level that allows us to sustain goods and services over time. And that's what this is all about. This is just a slide. I'm not going to go over it. Uh, it's in the paper. But it's just one of the ways of framing ecosystem services, the various different component parts. And there are many different ways to frame them. Those just give you some examples. But if you look at the list and have time to peruse it, you'll see that you know, it, it, these are pretty foundational to our way of life. Well, again, why to protect it? There's a quote from Environment Canada a few years ago, different environment ministers, but it said, it's essential to our competitiveness. We've kind of lost that thought, but it was said at one time by the federal uh, environment minister. And they'll have a quiz at the end as to who said it. And the prize is, I don't know, is there a prize, Tom? We, could, we, can, find we can find a prize. So we'll, we'll, we'll leave that as the quiz. Yes. Yes, and all of those with, uh, you know, there's Jessica with her computer Googling it, so uh, <laughs> that's not fair, that's cheating. Uh, but one of the other arguments is it's just cheaper. You know, so one of the, the pitches I give to people is that why would you spend more on water treatment when nature can do it more cost effectively? So these are arguments that I think we should keep in mind as going forward, in addition to if we really screw up and, and overshoot, we may be gone kind of worrying, and just, you know, how can you think of a quality of life without it? We don't tend to include enough measures of natural capital in our productivity studies. So it's like saying, we're going to do productivity without labor. Well, most studies of productivity are how many goods we produce, the value of GDP, per unit labor. But very few of them incorporate natural capital, and that is an omission. 
So here's just some, and I'm not going to go through these. These are some estimates taken from a number of papers throughout the world which show that either if you don't include it or you include the negative parts of it, productivity goes down. If you can improve the quality of the environment, there are estimates that productivity goes up. And I'll just draw your attention to the last one. This was done by Pierre Lasserre and another co-author whose name I can't pronounce. And they looked at 37 industries and said that if we reduce GHG emissions, we could increase productivity growth. So rather than having the, the usual rhetoric, which is it's jobs versus the environment, it's competitiveness, we should be thinking about natural capital in a productivity sense. So where are we? Well, I, as I started, I think we've got a lot of threats to our natural capital. These are just five of them. One is that we don't know what we've got. We don't know what it does. We don't have a good estimate of the importance of natural capital. Data is a huge problem trying to collect data, and it's both when you get to the how do we implement some of the policies, data is a significant gap. Uh, market failure, as I'm going to talk about in a minute. Long-term planning, well, you don't have long-term planning when you're not including an important input into the economy, but even with that input, it's challenging to get folks to, to plan out beyond the next election cycle. And finally, it, some of this stuff takes cash, so where are we going to get the cash? to try to invest in providing ecosystem services. So the challenges I want to look at are, are we providing enough? Are we providing the best type of natural capital, the, protecting the ecosystem goods and services that add the most value, and I appreciate value is a laden term, both economic value and other measures of value. Uh, how do we finance this? Again, coming back to the budget constraint issue. And can we do this in a way that is cost effective? In other words, we're not using up more resources than we need to to provide for a given outcome. So what's full cost pricing? Full cost pricing says there are three reasons why we don't have prices for things that I've just argued or tried to argue are fundamental to our economy. One is public goods. If I invest in something that benefits you, why would you pay for it if you can get it for free? My example is if I don't pave over my yard, the water supply, the runoff from my yard, I live on the side of a hill, will not go through your front door in uh, floods and high water levels. But you're not going to pay for that, so why should I invest? I'm going to pave it over because I'd rather have a patio, which is kind of what I did. Um, but you know, live by the book. Uh, but public goods, so investing in, in the attributes of environmental resources, if it's shared publicly, doesn't have a big payoff. Similarly, using the environment as a waste depository, also, you know, why pay for it when you can do it for free? The third one is through the regulatory process, we don't always price even the commodities that have market prices at the level that economists would say we have to have some form of, of pricing on the increment, the marginal cost pricing. So examples of water and electricity, most water pricing is administrative charges, electricity pricing is a blended historical average cost pricing. So those also create incentives for people to not be as conservative in their use as possible. Here's just a few, a few graphs on you know, what, what's at stake here. This is one on loss in productivity, loss of life due to air pollution done by the Canadian Medical Association. And I just call your attention to the, the, those are billions. And again, compared to the aggregate economy, it may not be so much, but these are you know, quality of life issues for lots of people, in addition to pure economic costs, productivity and healthcare costs. Um, and this doesn't count losses to agriculture, losses to material damage, and so on from air pollution. Here's water quality. Water quality is a tough thing to measure. And these are two components of water quality. Having too many nitrates and too much phosphorus makes it unsuitable for drinking, creates other problems for uh, agriculture and wildlife. And you can see here that it's kind of a mixed picture. I mean, there's some that are constant. And this is a sample of, of monitoring stations, not an unbiased. It's not a random sample. Uh, it's just the data that I could find, because not much of it exists. But it shows you that, you know, we got a few things on the, on the left-hand side where water quality issues are important. Here's a graph of, and I'm not going to go through these, but this just shows you the mixed 
sort of indicators of where we are in terms of environmental quality. Some success stories, sulfur dioxide emissions falling, some kind of wavering like particulate matter, others like uh, ground level ozone from photochemicals, smog, air pollution in urban areas going up, and of course the bottom line, greenhouse gases not going down over the last decade. So what's the federal government done? I'm going to focus first on the feds and then turn to, the, turn to BC. Uh, first thing I look at is how much money are they spending on the environment, recognizing this is an imperfect measure. Uh, but you can see from the, the figure, because you know, this is aggregate spending on the environment, in terms of their environmental goals, which I'll come to in a second. So you can see that it's not going up. It's gone down, come up a bit, but less than 1% or less than 2% of total government spending. So you get a feeling for the federal priorities. Now saying this, you know, a lot of environmental quality initiatives are provincial. They're not all federal. So I don't know what the optimal number is. I just look at, at levels of change. But, you know, clearly provincial spending is important as well. And <laughs> I used to be able to give you a chart on provincial spending, but they no longer collect that data in a nice digestible form. So I'd have to go to everybody's, every province's, uh, uh, you know, expenditures and try to ferret it out. Stackhan used to collect it and they, they don't anymore. Budget cuts. Okay, so federal goals. Energy and air. Clean air, energy use. Again, I'm not going to go through all these, but the picture I want you to take from that is most of the stuff the feds are doing in this area falls into two categories. One is subsidies, the second is regulations of some form. Examples of regulations are reducing the sulfur in fuels, fuel efficiency standards, and I'll come back to that. But these are incentives in the positive sense. These are spending tax dollars to try to incent shifts in production and consumption activities and predominantly energy efficiency and means of capturing carbon, and I'll come back to the, both of those. And the quantums there are billions of dollars, as you'll see in a minute. If we look at clean air or clean water and protecting the land, just look at the quantums. The quantums are 100 million and 340 million, and these are multi-year policies. So, you know, a little bit of tinkering, again, bearing in mind that a lot of this is provincial, uh, the federal government isn't doing, I would argue, very much on these, and these are expenditures to, to improve environmental quality. Um, some of the things they're doing that I think have more resonance and positive, and I'll come to why I think the others are not so positive, are some of the infrastructure funds. I mean, part of protecting natural capital is investing in infrastructure that allows us to protect natural capital, and that would be things like public transit, that would be water and sewer treatment because we're reducing the natural attributes that provide those same services and we simply can't keep up in an urban area. Uh, but if you look at funding for this, uh, it has wavered over time. Much of it has been downloaded to both provincial and local levels. And here are some of the, the, the billions that the government's done. One of the good things, I think, is the gas tax fund, although there are some areas which are controversial. And that's allocating part of the federal fuel excise tax to municipalities to invest in capital infrastructure that is compatible with sustainability. The green infrastructure fund was a billion dollars over five years, and uh, that's a bit little fuzzier to figure out where that money's gone. Not all of it is as accountable as in the gas tax fund. What does budget 2012 bring us? Uh, well, the hot topic, which we're not going to talk about a whole other theme is regulatory reform, but we can talk about that later. Uh, that's what's in budget 2012. The rest of it is tinkering. You know, a few more dollars for a few things in nature. So the big, the big news in the budget is no new programs, no new infrastructure spending, no new anything, some phase out of subsidies, Atlantic tax credit, and so on. So federal government subsidies targeting specific technologies. The two technologies the federal government on the carbon file has targeted along with provinces, Alberta, Saskatchewan, is carbon capture and storage and enhanced oil recovery. And virtually all of the federal 
subsidy funds to these kinds of technologies to reduce carbon emissions have gone into these two types of activities. Uh, I'm going to argue that some of the programs are not very well targeted, the GIF, the Green Infrastructure Fund. And the final thing is to say that giving us $50 million over two or three years is a drop in the bucket. You know, it's not going to be something that's going to make massive changes. So, subsidies. What's, why, why do I think those are a bad idea? Because of the following reasons. Most of the time, they do not promote efficiency. Uh, in the case of some of the subsidies that are now being phased out, in fairness, to the extractive sectors, they tend to tilt extraction to the present. If I give you a dollar of subsidy today, it's worth a lot more than waiting five years to get that dollar. I want the dollar today, so I'm going to invest in extraction or whatever exploration to be able to get that subsidy in a present value sense, which is higher today. So it may tilt the extraction path toward the present. So we may be taking out materials more quickly than might be the case if the subsidy hadn't existed. Canada, secondly, has a terrible record on innovation. We're one of the highest paying subsidizing countries in the OECD and one of the lowest in terms of actually transferring those subsidy dollars into actual innovations that lead to higher productivity, more output, better, better environmental quality, et cetera. So the track record isn't so robust. Finally, it's your tax dollars. And you probably ought to be asking more, how effective are those tax dollars? How much is being spent on these programs relative to that what they're producing? You know, economists talk about this as cost effectiveness. We've got some measure of output or delivering of whatever it is that the program's supposed to deliver, whether it's sequestering carbon or whether it's you know, investing in fish plants in Newfoundland, we should be able to show something for it. So we should be asking more questions on, are we getting the best bang for our buck? And it's sometimes hard to find this information. And I have scoured the Treasury Board and various ministries to get evaluations of the cost effectiveness of programs. And unfortunately, this is not something that's easy to find. Economists should be doing more of this, my colleagues in the room, you know, but it's, it's hard to get the data. Here's information gleaned from one of my own students' research. He was looking at technologies to in, invest in not, you know, in capturing carbon or utilizing carbon without releasing it to the environment. This is uh, three examples of ongoing projects in the oil sands, and they are uh, two enhanced oil recovery, one, two carbon capture and storage. And the dollar amounts here are the total amount invested as of a couple of years ago, and the subsidy component is shown. So we've got about $6 billion of investment total cost, both public and private, and about $2 billion of that is taxpayers' money. So the reduction in GHGs is the second to the right column. And cost effectiveness is then saying, well, how much are we reducing GHG emissions per dollar invested in this activity? We can talk about this later. I mean, this is, this is kind of a cheap shot on my part. It, it could be that we're so early in the technology cycle that these numbers, the GHG emission reductions, are going to be much, much bigger in the future that this is just the setup, the early stages of the technology development. And once we get the thing really up and running, that, that those numbers will be much bigger. And they may accumulate over time. But you know, maybe if I multiply by 50, I'll, I'll certainly get a different number. But it's still going to be a big number in terms of the cost. So the cost per ton of GHGs not emitted into the atmosphere in this diagram ranges from the ones that I've got dollars for just over $1,000 a ton to upwards of $1,400 a ton. BC carbon tax is $30 a ton to give you some perspective. A lot of companies in the oil sector are shadow pricing, inferring a carbon price of around $30 to $50 a ton. So the question I ask is, where do you want your tax dollars? Where do you want them to go? Do you want to go into protecting or reducing emissions at $1,400 a ton, recognizing that that money could be spent elsewhere, 
like protecting nature perhaps, protecting forests which are going to store carbon, versus uh, investing in these activities. The last one is two weeks ago, a consortium of TransAlta and Enbridge, and I forget the third company, canceled their project outright. Not efficient, not effective, didn't think it was going to work. So that's $1.4 billion, of which just under $800 million was taxpayers' money. And you know, when you divide zero into 1.4, it's a pretty expensive project. So you might say it's all part of technology development. You know, we're going to have some losers in here. But you know, until we start looking at these numbers and saying, where are these dollars going? Is this the best way to spend our money? Um, I, you know, we, I think we've got to start asking these questions. In addition to the cost effectiveness, there are other impacts of subsidies. The corn ethanol story, unintended consequences affecting the food supply. You all heard about the tortillas in Mexico. But it affected Canadian food supply because corn is a feedstock into the production of livestock. And you know, so did you really want to convert fields from producing food to producing fuel? And you know, again, you've got to look at the nature of the subsidy program. Which one should it be at? Um, you might argue that you know, we need this boost in, in subsidies to get an industry off the ground, to get the technology off the ground. And uh, you know, we've, we've been investing in CCS for quite a few years now. Again, I can't tell you that tomorrow there's going to be some breakthrough that's going to make it the, uh, the solution to the emission problem. But you know, there's, there's been a long time. And we're, we're picking winners. And as I've said, we've, we've not got a very good track record of picking winners. So my argument is, in full cost pricing, that we would, you know, let's, let's ask these questions about subsidies, but then let's talk about more whether we could use as an adjunct to them pricing carbon. If you price carbon or other environmental contaminants, you also provide an incentive. You provide an incentive for people to look for ways to minimize the emissions, the, the use of fuels that generates the carbon. So if you had that incentive on top of or in place of the subsidies, I would argue we get more bang for our buck. Consumer subsidies are equally suspect. Economists love to write about these things, and they're in the paper. There are lots of, or they're referenced to examples in the paper. A free rider is somebody who would have made the investment without the subsidy. My husband is an economist. He's a free rider. He bought a Prius. He took every dollar the province and the feds gave him. Why did he buy the Prius? The subsidy actually had nothing to do with it. He bought it in 2008 when fuel prices were $1.50 a liter. He did the present value calculation, which is to say, here's how much fuel I'm going to save each year, because the car runs on air, practically. And at $1.50 a liter, the payback period for investing in this car versus a less fuel efficient car is three years. He was wrong on the fuel prices. They came down again. Good economist always predicting things wrong. Um, but he took the subsidies. I said, you know, that's immoral. That's unethical. You shouldn't be taking them. And he said, I'd be a chump if I didn't take them. So not being a chump is called a free rider, because if everybody else is taking them, I bought a new energy efficient washer. I filled in the subsidy form too. So, you know, these are people, and it's because they're, the, the programs are pretty much universal, they're not targeted, and I'm going to come to that again. The rebound effect says if you get something more efficient, there might be a tendency to use more of it. Fuel efficient vehicles may go further distances. Now, if they're not burning any carbon, you know, you're going to say, well, you know, if they're an electric vehicle, assuming the electricity isn't generated in a carbon intensive way, you know, maybe that's an okay thing, but we still have congestion. You know, we still have other costs associated with it. So, you know, my argument is it's hard to have a rebound effect with an efficient refrigerator. You know, it's there, it consumes less power, that's a good thing. Light bulbs, very controversial, they still sort of give light, other disposal problems, but no rebound effect there. But automobiles, I wash my clothes a lot more now because I have a high efficiency washer. Well, I smaller loads, right? You know, specialty loads. So that, my washer's going 24 7, but uh, it's still only costing 40 cents a year to run it. So, so that's the rebound effect. Third thing is the market's kind of working here. If the price of energy goes up, if we had full cost pricing, then the market's going to respond by producing better goods. 
And here's some data on the increase in energy efficiency of products, you know, over time. And they are much more efficient. So if we raise the price of something, people look for ways to reduce our consumption of it. And that's where full cost pricing comes in. Universality is an issue. I mean, my husband did not need the subsidies. I didn't need the subsidies for the washer in the car. But there are a lot of people who would. And these are people on income constrained and you know, renters who don't have choices. But the programs are not targeted. So again, I'd probably you know, be more sympathetic to subsidy programs that were better targeted at those people that have no other option and would not be free riders. Um, last one just says be careful what you're substituting into. Here's, here's another figure on cost effectiveness, and here's Transport Canada, love the agency. They produce, they haven't removed all of their interesting papers from their website like some other agencies have. Try to find the paper on corn ethanol done by Environment Canada. And let me know, right? It's, it's gone. Uh, but Transport Canada is, is a little bit you know, below the radar screen. So here's a study they did on various eco-efficiency programs. And you can see there's, it's really quite mixed. Some of the ones, and don't ask me what all of these are in detail because I won't remember, but you know, the first three, pretty darn efficient. If we're again using BC's carbon price of $30 a ton as kind of a benchmark, those are all winners, the first three, $2 to $10 a ton. You might even argue that, again, of carbon reduced. You might even argue that the marine shore power, you know, most people think $100, 100 is, is the price we're going to need to get real reductions. But look at the last two. There's my husband, $4,500 per ton carbon reduced. That's the auto rebate program. That's the Prius. And the vehicle scrappage is to get your old clunkers off the road. Those do reduce carbon, very popular, sounds like a good thing, $1,200 a ton. So again, I ask, you know, is this the best use of taxpayers' money? And would we get equivalent or cheaper reductions by pricing carbon instead of subsidizing its investment in, its, in energy efficiency stuff? You know, would I get people buying an automobile at a carbon, a fuel efficient car at a carbon price of under $4,000 a ton? You bet. We just raised gas prices in Greater Vancouver with a transportation tax. And I can tell you, our fuel taxes uh, revenues are hemorrhaging. We're not collecting revenue. Our ridership is up just under 9% on public transit. And I mean, yes, a lot of people are driving to the US and buying gas. And yes, they're driving. I don't think they come to Victoria. It's a little, the ferry barrier is, is a good one. So keep those prices high. But you know they're going to places outside Greater Vancouver to buy their gas, but nonetheless, a lot more of them are parking their cars. You know, and so our fuel prices are now, we have a 17 cents a liter fuel tax in Greater Vancouver. So I don't think it's gonna take $4,000 of a carbon tax to get people to switch. I mean, I don't even know what the price of gas would be, but I mean, let's, it's, it's 2.4 cents for every uh, $5 a ton carbon tax. So if we got up to $50, $60 a ton, I would predict there are going to be a lot of people making energy substitutions. And we have the tax revenue to do something else with. So, you know, again, why are we putting up with this inefficiency? So back to natural capital. How do we get more of it? How do we sustain it? Well, I would argue that we need to do more infrastructure investment. Barrier there is funding. We've got to protect more natural areas, but we also have to provide incentives for folks on private lands, remember the public good problem, to invest in protecting natural capital. And that requires some funding of it. So if we want to incent people to do things that are in the public interest, you know, unless they're all do-gooder people, they, which of course they are, but they, you know, a little financial incentive there might, payment system through full cost pricing might help. And then, as I keep saying, there's no, there's no full cost pricing of contaminants. So talked about the infrastructure barrier. My argument here would be, and there's just more on congestion and the stuff I talked about, I would phase out energy subsidies completely. You know, give it time. I mean, we're not going to do it abruptly. If you've made an investment, we want to make sure we're not stranding that investment because that's not good for the economy. But why do, you know, I've given him, some of them might be good, at least phase out the ones 
that are costing us over $1,000 a ton to generate a reduction in GHG emissions um, or other air contaminants. I don't even have it per, per unit of air contaminant reduction. There is at least hundreds of millions of dollars here. I mean, estimates range from, you know, $100 million a year in these, in these subsidy programs to much, much bigger numbers. Uh, yeah, the federal, the, this is again the feds, but the feds, when you add on the, pro, this is just federal money, when you add on the provincial subsidies as well, uh, we're talking about a fair amount of revenue. That's revenue that could be put into public transit, that could be put into protecting natural areas, that could be put into uh, looking at things that are enhancing natural capital. As I said, one, one candidate is more money. Give us all of the gas tax fund, not just half of it. So looking at natural areas, so infrastructure, one of the ways to protect natural capital is to invest in infrastructure. The second way is to ensure that we're not depleting our natural capital through paving it over and you know, converting its productive activities to ones that are just unproductive from a natural capital point of view. And these are just a list of things that are going on right now and uh, very tough to get an aggregate estimate. You've probably seen some of them in the literature. I don't trust the aggregate ones, but again, hundreds of millions of dollars of loss of ecosystem services because of uh, destroying natural areas. So what a number of people are talking about and practicing and uh, experimenting with in various parts of the world are payments for ecosystem services which is providing, remember the public good thing, by full cost pricing, we're going to price the contaminants, tax them, bad word, tax, and then use the tax revenue or the savings from all these subsidies to invest in a PES type system, payment for ecosystem services on private lands where you can well document the activity and the response to protecting nature. There are a number of papers that look at evidence. There are a number of, of uh, pilot programs and other studies. ALICE is the alternative land use studies, which are you know, uh, across Canada and in BC and, and different provinces. We've got some initiatives by ranchers in BC to do the same things on grasslands. So you know, unless we have both the, the incentive to tax the things that are public bads, and the incentive to, to pay for things that are public goods properly documented, we're going to continue to lose natural areas. So back to why full cost pricing. Number one, the sooner we get going, or the longer we delay, the, the sooner we get going, the better. The longer we delay, the more expensive it's going to be. And there's of avoided costs. And that is, if we allow emissions and degradation of land to continue, then it's going to cost us more in the future to either clean it up, compensate for us. When we drain wetlands, when we you know, change the forests, we're losing those natural attributes and we're going to have to substitute human-made capital for them, which can cost way more than protecting nature. Um, I've argued that I think it will be efficiency enhancing to do the pricing. Again, I'm not throwing out some of the regulations, but without the pricing, we've lost the power of the market to incent people to, to do things that are socially desirable. And here's, here's a quote back when they canceled the uh, Transalta Enbridge CCS project. That's one of their VP's quotes saying, what's really needed is a putting a price on carbon. So, I mean, it's not that the entire corporate sector is saying, oh my God, we're going to go out of business, a lot of them are saying, you know, we recognize what's going on here, let's start pricing things. So, where are we in BC? Well, we've got a carbon policy review coming up. You probably read, if you're in this room, you probably are cognizant of what's going on in, in BC politics and BC uh, initiatives. And the carbon file is under a bit of threat right now. There's a review of its effectiveness, there's a review and there's challenges to the, to the policy regime. Um, I'm trying to argue that I think the case, when you look at what we're doing with subsidies that are not generating very much reduction, and you think about how we could add to that by pricing, I don't think $30 a ton is anywhere close to being the right price of carbon. Um, one of the controversial issues, and we can talk about this in, in the questions, is 
you know, what do you do with the revenue? One of the big strengths, I think, of the BC carbon policy is that in its onset, it was revenue neutral. But if the price goes up, I think there's room to look at other uses of the tax revenue. So, you know, my basic theme is if we want to have smart environmental policy, BC has been a leader in this. Don't give up. Don't give up now. So finally, here's the, you know, the moral message at the end. I've got grandkids. I care about what they do. My, my, they live in the basement. That's how bad the quality of life. I live in Vancouver. They can't afford to live anywhere else. I'd, I'd like to, to think that I'm not going to totally screw up their life. I've already messed up the housing market by, you know, having too many of us want to live in a place that rains all the time. So, uh, you know, let's try not to screw up the rest of it. Thanks a lot, and I'll be happy to take questions. Well, thanks very much, uh, Nancy. And uh, I suspect there might be a question or two uh, stimulated by your presentation. Uh, but I would ask that you use the talking stick so that we can all hear. And I bet, Jessica, are we going to get uh, emails, questions from the, uh, the ether world? We're looking. Are OK, there so there, there, may, there may be ether world questions as well. So if there's a question, please let me know, and I'll pass the talking stick. All the economists in the room don't have questions. Oh, there's one. If uh, I can just ask you to pass it down. Francis, can I get you that? I'm just wondering if, uh, so, so you're promoting this, uh, basically increasing the tax rate and things. Uh, um, I'm just wondering if you have a prediction of the, so you, you've shown us how much you're paying to, uh, in, with the subsidies. Um, yeah, if you have a comparison, like a prediction of how much we'll be like, like uh, paying, uh, how much we'll be reducing uh, with, with that. Oh, sorry. Do you want to know if we get rid of the subsidies, how much we're saving, or do you want to know how much I think the carbon tax rate should be? I can answer both. I, the, the subsidy amount is tricky to compute because the, the correct way to do it is to look at, those, those are just federal I'm talking about. Well, I'm talking about both, but you have to look through the tax system at what it means to reduce the subsidies through the provincial system too. So, I mean, there's uh, royalty payments for oil and gas extraction. And uh, in the paper, I cite a paper by Jack Mintz and Ken McKenzie that does the correct calculation of what the subsidy uh, removal will cost. So I don't have an, a, a number because you'd have to look at all of them and do it for each province that has it. But it's, you know, my guess is hundreds of millions of dollars a year. On the carbon tax price, what's the price have to be? Where are the carbon modelers in the room? Any carbon modelers in the room? What? On the open market, yeah. Uh, but what is the? I mean, so what does the price have to be to get real reductions? Hundred dollars a ton. You know. I mean, I can, I can reduce a lot of carbon, I think, at $100 a ton, maybe even at $50 a ton. You know, again, looking at all of these, the, you know, what it translates into into fuel prices. So, uh, you know, why is the price $10 a ton, Keith? Um, I think there's a lot of corruption involved. So it's, it's when, and what Keese is talking about is the European trading system, which is a cap and trade system for carbon in, in Europe, hence the name Europe, if there is Europe anymore. Uh, and it's the policy design that's part of the problem, it, that things were exempted, allowances, which is how much you get to do for free. I mean, if, if you're a producer, you want to do as much free, right? So let's exempt the first you know, 100 megatons of carbon we emit per year and then tax us on the rest. So part of the European system was that they gave a lot of those kinds of allowances. The other is regulatory uncertainty. If you don't know what's going to happen next year, um, you know, look at the U.S. SO2 market. There's a market in 
trading sulfur dioxide from the major power plants and now was to be extended beyond fossil fuel combusting electrical generators. Uh, they got taken to court. They had to cease and desist. They're now studying other regulatory ways to do it. This was a program that by you know, dozens of econ papers, pretty successful. And now the regulatory environment is fuzzy, to say the least. WCI, Western Climate Initiative. I don't know. I mean, where's it going? Nowhere fast, right? So part of it is, uh, part of that's good news. <laughs> part of it's not so good news. But, you know, a market works well when people know who's in it. There's, you know, some certainty that the market's going to continue to exist. There are enough buyers and sellers. The good itself has, you know, is value is created or already there. And we just haven't had those preconditions yet. But a carbon price, if it were to be imposed, nationally, internationally, as a lot of people are calling for, then the world, I think, would start changing pretty quickly. You know, if the U.S. election leads to uh, a better backbone down there to say that maybe it is climate change is an issue, uh, and the U.S. were to flip into some sort of carbon pricing, I think federally we would be uh, there in a heartbeat. Because, anybody remember softwood lumber? Subsidies? You know, what do you think we're doing to our oil and gas sector? What do you think the U.S. would say if they had a carbon tax and we didn't? Mm -hmm. Subsidies, right? We'd be hauled in front of the trade tribunals. We would, we'd have a tax. So, I mean, it would be smarter to anticipate that and, and get out in front. Hi. Hi. I have definitely enjoyed your talk. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'm all for full cost pricing. Thank you. Now, the question is, of course, what is full cost pricing? And that boils down to valuing, uh, you know, the damage of carbon emissions, for instance. And I think the conundrum, and it's the same as valuing uh, the walk in the park, right? And the, and, the, and the thing is that even in this room, that probably would value the walk in the park a little bit more highly than, than the average person yeah. in society. You know, even in this room, we'd get a fight about what that value would be. And then what I always see is the conundrum Then, since we're getting a fight, if we try to determine what is the true value, for either carbon or the walk in the park, it doesn't matter what. The default stays, and the default is that there's no value put on these things. So how do you really solve that conundrum? It's, the real problem I see is not one of theory, it's one of implementation. Sure. I, I mean, I think there, there are two answers. One is the pragmatic approach, which is, you know, basically, I think what we did with the carbon tax, which is to say, let's just start it at, you know, $5 a ton. Did anybody think that was going to create any real response? No. I mean, you might have read the news release that said this is good, but, you know, give me a break, $5 a ton, nobody even noticed it. So, you know, starting at a low level and something like that, where we do have climate modeling, where we do know that there are certain thresholds, I mean, carbon is one of the easier ones. Because if you look at the carbon modeling, um, and work backwards and say, you know, what do we need to keep the temperature down to and how many emissions do we not need to have? You can sort of say, well, here's, and we look at elasticities of demand with respect to fuels. We can kind of work backwards and benchmark a price. It's going to be fuzzy, but at least you can say I'm working backwards from a target. But I think you use that principle in, in all sorts of other things. So let me give you an example with water quality. Um, I know what it costs to build a sewage treatment plant or a water quality treatment plant. That's not a number that's hard to get. I know what, I mean, I, don't ask me the number, but it's hundreds of millions of dollars, but figuratively I know. Um, and I, you know, and I can figure out what I need to do to up, you know, to up, we're, we're looking at billions of dollars of upgrading water treatment supplies in greater Vancouver, some of which probably not necessary, but to, to deal with sediment, to deal with toxins, et cetera. So I can again work backwards from that and say, well, here's what it costs to have a human-made substitute for the natural capital. If I protect X amount of watershed, will I reduce those treatment costs? You know, I won't have to go into the nitrates and phosphates treatment. I can just clean out the dirt and the animal excrement and good stuff like that, and make it safe for bacteria. And that difference would be the price. Okay, so those are things like that. Pricing a walk in the park and nature, well, some of my econ colleagues know that we, 
we can price everything. Uh, just give us, give us a survey, give us people. And again, it's controversial, but uh, people do respond. And sometimes we actually have mechanisms to get them pay, to pay. So one of my grad students was looking at the Scott Islands off the coast here, uh, a marine protected area. And the marine protected area exists, but uh, Parks Canada or the Canadian Wildlife Service wanted to contemplate expanding the protected area to include the waters because it's the only nesting site for some goofy looking bird that dives. And, um, <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I'm not a biologist, Tom. <laughs> it's a critter. It does, you know, it's not as photogenic as penguins. <laughs> but, you know, we have 95% of the breeding areas there. So, what did she do? She did a survey on YouTube. And one of the payment vehicles was, would you be willing to download an app for X amount of, you know, 99 cents to 4.99 to watch the goofy bird diving? Well, like hundreds of people, she had 800 respondents, and they're all buying the app. So there's a price, okay? It's not a perfect price, but at least it says, you know, these are people that want to see these birds fish and do things. So, you know, there's a lot of studies going on. There's no universal approach. It's not perfect, but, you know, my argument is zero and infinite are not very good prices on either end. So it's hard, and, you know, pick, pick the ones that you can pick off and do something about. So, you know, there are a lot of people that are practicing, not just preaching. Thanks. It's a wonderful summary of the state of the art, and it seems to me a good argument for the practical value of some, some first steps, get beyond zero. Um, what about the possibility of a somewhat broader regulatory approach that says some of these decisions we don't need prices on. If you take a strong sustainability sort of approach, there are some things uh, that doesn't, it's not worth it to compromise. Right. Uh, some of the other uh, arguments might be around this uh, payment for ecosystem yeah. services. Right. I mean, why do we alienate the rights in the first place. They were in the public domain. Can't we provide rights which uh, transfer the necessary authorities over these uh, natural capital uh, components without giving away uh, the public claim on, uh, on undiminished uh, ecological flows or, or uh, various other constraints of that kind. So the question is really, uh, can we not approach these things away from zero on the one side and down from infinity on the other, the other side, with sure. some uh, regulatory property rights type reforms? And I get yeah, absolutely. And I, on the regulatory side, if there's something that's so foundational to natural capital, we should just protect it. I mean, no argument there. You know, they're, they're, why price it? I mean, if it's essential. Um, you know, one might argue that the climate's a little essential. Um, on the other side, once we've alienated it through private property rights, as you know, it's just real tough to get them back. But that's where the pricing, it, you know, there, it works both ways. There's the payment for ecosystem services, and then there's the taxing you if you do bad things. So I want to pay you for the good things and tax you for the bad things. And, you know, the revenues can flow from one to the other. But, you know, I guess one of your questions are, we, we don't alienate mineral rights on land. You know, you own the land, but somebody can come and start digging up in your backyard if they stake a claim for it. Why don't we have some natural capital attributes that are also not alienable, but belong to the public? Good, interesting concept if we could define some of those in a way that was concrete enough to say, you know, you're part of, you know, you're part of the ecosystem. <laughs> You, you just can't destroy that. You're not going to pave it over. One of the biggest challenges is, is at the local level. You know, municipalities are hugely challenged by this because what's their revenue base? Property taxes. Where do property taxes come from? Buildings, construction, not natural areas. So some of the kind of innovative payments for ecosystem services are, again, talking about sort of complex markets, but if you want to put an apartment building or condo building here, you've got to protect an equivalent natural area that has the same attributes. Places in the states are looking at that. You know, it may work in certain areas where you have good identification of the attributes, 
But again, it's sort of saying that we're going to carve out the attributes from the land. Um, yeah. I think we have time for th uh, three last questions. Francis, did you? Was that you? Are you going to talk goofy birds? Is that, you've seen you respond to that. So there's a question here, one in the middle, and Tom, you've got the last one. So I'm, I'm going to ask a goofy question, oh, or at least, no. a, yeah, at least a naive I, question. I, yeah, I'm, I'm waiting for this, but, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, the question is, that I, I wonder whether it's wise to link something like carbon taxes to something like uh, subsidies for carbon capture and storage or, or some other emissions reduction measure. And, and the reason I'm asking is that you mentioned figures of magnitude of $100 million, or perhaps it's a billion dollars. Uh, it doesn't strike me that those numbers are large. Uh, yet they evoke all kinds of, of, uh, of negative reactions amongst decision makers. And so um, if this is a, a, if the subsidy doesn't actually distort the economy very much, then why worry about it? Yeah. Well, I mean, you've got to pick your fights, right? Uh, I mean, I don't know, six billion into CCS. As I said, maybe it's going to prove out one of these days, but I would rather see that money go into, uh, you know, I would rather generate the revenue. I mean, 1.2 billion is what we generate a year with the current carbon tax. That's all gone into tax cuts, right? Uh, you know, totally supportive of that. So you got to pick your fights. But I think that we would do better, and I don't know the number. I mean, it might be a half a billion a year, but start accumulating that amount out. So I don't, you know, I, Earmarking is a tricky question. Economists, yeah, yeah, economists get kind of twitchy about earmarking because it you know, might be the last dollar spent might have been spent better elsewhere, but the public likes it better. They like to see concrete outcomes, and that's one of the challenges we face here is that people don't only see their tax return. They don't think about it daily. They think about the prices daily. But I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it's a good thing to have them think about the prices because then they're going to start looking at their behavior. So that's not a very good answer to your question. It's just kind of like, well, pick your fight. Pick the important. Actually, I think that um, dovetails very well to your answer to the question. Oh, okay, thank I was, you. Yeah, uh, so again. I'm always uh, <laughs> baffled by um, the public also demanding preferring subsidies over, over taxation because they, they live under this illusion that subsidies are just coming from nowhere. And taxes, they know they have to pay. Uh, and so I think, um, you know, where's the role of economists to better communicate to the media uh, and, and to the public that um, really, as you said, uh, it's much more efficient to pay the price. And one more comment about this. The other thing that people say is that, oh, in principle, I would be for taxes, but I'm so worried about the low-income people. Yeah. And you see that all the time. And we know what to do with the low-income yeah, people to them shield money. them. Yeah. Exactly. We hand them cash. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, well, let me ask you. I think, is, is, it, is it useful to talk about cost effectiveness? I mean, I'm an economist. To me, talking about cost effectiveness mm -hmm. is like, bread and butter. It's like I get up every morning and think, is this an efficient allocation of resources? I realize that I'm probably a little strange, but it's, it's you know, don't other people care about that? So, I mean, I think that's, that's the sort of thing that I would say, do you really want, you know, here's, here, I want the program that's $2 a ton, not $4,000 a ton. So I think that's, I think that's an effective argument. Um, but, you know, we also have to get away from, we've, we've allowed ourselves to get into the to, the, to be shaped by the media. And no offense to the media, if there are in the room, but, you know, taxes are bad. Public opinion polls of British Columbians, what's the number, Tom? 62 thirds of British Columbians? 74 percent, almost three quarters of British Columbians support the carbon tax. Okay, taxes are bad, but three quarters of us think it's a good policy. Why do they think it's a good policy? Well, I think it's the right thing to do. I don't, they haven't even seen, you know, they don't even know what the impacts are yet, and that's something to be worked on. So I think we shouldn't always fall into that trap to say, you know, without taxes, we don't have any public sector. You know, so where do you think your healthcare dollar? I think that's the rising price of fuel. Yeah. 
Sure. Oh, I mean, I, I was listening to a radio show one time about the cost of water treatment. And I almost drove off. I was driving in those days. I don't drive anymore. I take public transit because, you know, it would be bad image to be in my car. All these things matter. But I almost drove off the road. The callers were going, well, isn't water? It should be supplied free. It should be free. Water, it comes from the sky. Why do we have to pay for it? And you're going like, um, you know, those pipes to your house, the treatment. You know, if you want to collect buckets of water in your backyard, be my guest. But it's, it's, you know, I don't know. You've got to tell those kind of stories, and, and you're absolutely right. But two comments, I think cost effectiveness is important. And secondly, don't believe everything you read. Uh, you know, the public isn't as antagonistic as you think when faced with the trade-off of not getting something. I mean, our citizens, I'll, I'll come back to my, my own small world of transportation right now. Uh, we put in the funding increase last fall. The mayors of Greater Vancouver, 21 mayors and one First Nation, voted to increase gas taxes. And they passed that, you know, two cents a liter, which on top of 15 cents a liter makes 17. But, I mean, it's a big increase. They did this right before the municipal elections. Not one mayor was voted out of office that ran. Did their public think you're evil because you raised our taxes? Perhaps. Did they think they were so bad that they wanted to boot them out? No. Look at Alberta. Yeah, look at their last provincial election, you know, versus somebody that wanted to look at, you know, a much broader sense of, of you know, where the role of the province was and wasn't totally antagonistic to climate policy versus someone that does. The poll said Wild Rose is going to win. So don't be pessimistic. Just get out there and tell everybody, taxes are good. <laughs> taxes are good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Tom, you've got the last uh, word, and uh, you'll just have to bellow away. Like you want my mic? <laughs> Thank you. Well, it comes uh, falls to me to, to thank Nancy today. And uh, my name is Tom Peterson. I'm the director of PICS. And it is a great pleasure to have the, the honor of, of thanking her. Uh, Nancy's discussion today is based on a major report that she issued about five weeks ago or so. You can link to it on our website, in fact. It's in called uh, Environmental Full Cost Pricing or something like that. Yes. Yeah, like through it's the Manning fine. Center same, in Alberta. Same title. Yeah. And uh, as it turns out, it has been one of the most downloaded reports, I think, ever on that site. So she is, her work is having oh, tremendous 29 impact. times. <laughs> I didn't want to say a number. I just said one of the most downloaded ever. I just, we should do YouTube videos and get a million hits, but. And taxes are good. Remember that too. Thank you, Tom. And so, uh, but I want to tell you a little bit more about Nancy. In addition to the many things that Lawrence outlined at the beginning, you know, she is chairman of the board of, of BC Transit. No, no, TransLink. Uh, TransLink, I'm sorry, TransLink. She was formerly on the board of BC Hydro. She teaches students. She's a brilliant teacher, as you can see. <laughs> she lobbies or presents to politicians across the country very frequently. She's in great demand internationally as a speaker. And beyond all of that, she has been a stalwart with the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions since day one as a member of our program committee. And she's one of the people that, that PICS turns to often for wise advice. And I think you've seen that wisdom exemplified here in the discussion today. In terms of natural capital for Canada, this is a tremendous resource. <laughs> thank you very much. So thank you, Nancy. We appreciate taking time out of your busy schedule to come. Thank you.